Hey guys, Eric from Chrome and Cube here. I'm glad you guys liked my little analysis on Ironwood's plan. So first of all, a big thanks to everyone who made this video so successful, since it is a marked departure from the usual format. The discussion generated in the comments has been incredible, so I thought I'd just follow up and touch on a few of those, and bring up some points that may have been missed in the initial video. If you haven't already, the first video will be in the pinned comment down below, so do give it a watch if you haven't already. Now, since I'm still trying to navigate my way around the video essay slash analysis format, I'd be remiss to not mention that the first video was lacking a central thesis in its script. So for posterity, I'll state it right now. The purpose of the first video was to highlight how even under a best case scenario, Ironwood's plans would still have flaws. The alternate history whoopsie. There were a few points of contention in regards to the plausibility of the alternate history timeline I laid out. And after some more consideration, I'm agreeing with some of these criticisms. The first would be whether or not Cinder would still be repelled. Team Ruby's initial motivation for retrieving the Winter Maiden was to stop Ironwood from accessing the relic. We have to stop Ironwood. If he can't access the relic, he can't move Atlas. We just have to get to the Winter Maiden. So they likely wouldn't feel the need to be present if they're already on board with Ironwood's plan. Ironwood also deemed that Penny was sufficient protection for the procedure, but as we can see in the battle, this is clearly not sufficient. And it's a little baffling as to why they don't call for assistance. There was even this convenient lull in action that Winter could have whipped out her scroll and said, Cinder at Maiden Vault need reinforcements. If no intervention occurred, Cinder would likely overwhelm and kill Winter and Penny. Cinder showed us she was able to keep up with Raven, an intermediate Maiden in the Battle of Haven, so it's not unlikely for her to outdo a newly minted Maiden who might not fully grasp how the powers work yet. The second point of contention would be whether or not Neo gets the lamp. Because at least the military pressure will be on her and not Junior, it'll be less likely that she gets it. As for how to catch Neo, knowing that the enemy is mute would be helpful. A simple verbal challenge would be enough to discern who's who. Now, I don't think Ironwood will be happy when he finds that the lamp still has one more question left on it, but I'm sure he'll be happy to have the help all the same. Even though he likely won't have the Maiden anymore. Now, as for what that question should be, the most popular one among the fandom seems to be how do I defeat Salem? Not destroy, as Ozma put it. The amendment of right now, or right f***ing now, depending on the urgency, may or may not be necessary since genies are f***ing dicks, and they seem to hate Canada for some reason. Well, I'm off to destroy Canada. They've had it too good for too long. If you have an alternate question you'd ask Jin, feel free to share it down below and explain your reasoning. Dust and the Inverse Square Law So, if you don't know what the Inverse Square Law is, let's have Chuck explain it in layman's terms. Mr. McGill, if you'd please. The farther away it is, the stronger the source needs to be to have an effect. Now with that in mind, let's hear what the world of Remnant has to say about dust as it leaves the atmosphere. Unfortunately, modern man has yet to make the technological advancements required to achieve spaceflight, as all known dust types lose their power as they begin to leave Remnant's atmosphere. A lot of you questioned whether dust would work at all in Ironwood's plan. Now, I would hope that the General will know about the flight limit, hence his wording. Ironwood's exact wording, once again, is high up in the atmosphere. And if the wording of leaving the atmosphere in World of Remnant is true, then I would say it's safe to assume that dust will still work in Ironwood's plan. However, this may mean it will work at reduced efficiencies, which may make his situation more dire. The Grim New Types The reason why I didn't speculate on this too much is because of how little is known about these two new types. But basically, if Salem's new Grim and herself can't exceed the flight limit, then Ironwood's situation would just deteriorate even faster than in our first video's optimistic timeline. The next topic is possible water resupply. It's theorized that if a Winter Maiden were to create a large amount of snow or ice, it would be feasible to meet the water demands of the city. Okay, let's say that this would be effortless on the part of our Maiden, as a best case scenario once again. The city of Toronto, a city with a population of 2.7 million, needs 1 billion liters of water a day. That's equivalent to 400 Olympic sized swimming pools. This would be a considerable time investment and this is assuming that they have the facilities in which this could be a possibility. Further, it may act as a training regimen for our Maiden, which could be beneficial in the long run, assuming it's feasible. Ironwood's Martial Law The reason why I left this out in the first video was that it would simply take too long. Civil liberties being restricted almost never goes down well. As a modern example, when Canada's Pierre Elliott Trudeau, yes, father to this Trudeau, instigated martial law because two diplomats were kidnapped, troops patrolled the streets and people were detained without due process. When famously asked how far he would take it, he'd respond with, Oh, just watch me. 
He faced a lot of scrutiny and this topic is still debated in history classrooms across the nation. And that was 50 odd years ago. Now, if that sounds applicable to this situation, well, it's because it is. It's only natural that the same would happen in Atlas's situation of crisis, and we saw this unrest bubble up during the events of Volume 7. While Ironwood is making his declaration of martial law to sound like a surefire bet to get the situation under control, forcing everyone to fall into line is much more difficult than it sounds, and will put the military under more strain. Speaking of the military, there may even be units of the Elysian military that feel sympathetic to the Elysian people and refuse orders. Notably, Major General Xu Xianxian of the People's Liberation Army refused to mobilize his troops prior to the Tiananmen Square massacre. Even some small units didn't have the will to act against Beijing residents, breaking bread with them in some instances. However, in a more dramatic showing, the 16th and 27th armies exchanged fire on the outskirts of Beijing. Forcing the situation may ironically bring about the opposite outcome that Ironwood is hoping for. At best, there will be reluctant obedience under the threat of violence, and at worst, there will be splinter factions in the political and military institutions, further weakening Atlas's ability to resist. The Patrick Star Plan Some questioned whether or not Atlas could be repurposed into a mobile command center, or as I like to call it, the Patrick Star Plan. We should take the city of Atlas and push it somewhere else! Now, there doesn't seem to be any visible propulsion mechanisms on Atlas itself, so it's not known if this thing can actually move side to side. Now, of course, it could function similarly to Amity Arena, which is seen to be mobile between all four kingdoms, but I'd argue this is a pretty big assumption, since retreat would be a far superior option in the general's position. And if it were available, I'm sure he would take it. But, for the sake of argument, let's go out on a limb and say this can be accomplished. Even if the issues with water and food are resolved, there is still the question of raw material. Fuel is obviously the hot button topic. Even if they managed to fly over to an area rich in dust, they would still need to dock and set up facilities, which would be, of course, rather vulnerable. This would also apply to the issue of other raw materials and resources. Attrition and losses of equipment would inevitably necessitate repairs. Medical supplies would run out, basic amenities would start to become scarce, and raw material from the surface and the ability to process it is necessary to keep a city running. And once again, I'm not sure if Atlas, which seems to be a residential district, would have that capability. The Relic of Creation has become an integral part of many fan theories and has been viewed to be a miraculous item that can literally create anything. Specifically, it has been seen as a way of reviving characters, which, funnily enough, was a joke by Ruby Rose's voice actress, Lindsay Jones. However, even if it weren't a joke, the latter angle doesn't hold much water to me. The God of Light specifically point to Ozma's resurrection as non-creation, so why would he give his own relic this ability if he views resurrection as an abomination? Now onto the former theory, if the staff were a mechanism for creating anything, would Ozma not have tried already to create a weapon or item capable of defeating Salem? General Ironwood describes the relic as a limitless energy source. Now while this doesn't sound impressive on its own in a world full of awesome technology and magic, we in our modern age are able to accomplish all that we can because we harness energy in ways that our predecessors couldn't. A seemingly infinite energy source that is self-contained in something the size of a school gymnasium is nothing short of miraculous and I don't think people are giving this the credit it deserves. Now, even if the relic could be used to conjure up miracle weapons, it would still mean removing it from its current task. Keeping the city afloat. The comedy of trying to conjure up a weapon and then quickly put the staff back is not lost on me, but it's not known if these items would even stick around. Because, once again, the staff can only be used for one purpose at a time. Would Team Ruby's plan work? Ironically, for the reasons I outlined in the previous video, Team Ruby's plan is the one I would take if retreat were not possible. Just not for the main reason they gave. Also, if you heard those air quotes I just used on the word plan, it's because they don't actually have a plan, it's just boundless idealism and nothing practical. Now why would I take Team Ruby's side in this scenario? A siege situation seems unfavorable, and running doesn't seem to be possible. One of the most crucial passages of Sun Tzu's Art of War speaks on different types of ground. There are nine types, but the relevant one here is desperate ground. A situation in which we can't retreat, or where we lose strength the longer we avoid fighting. So fight we must. If you have a topic that you would like to suggest for another video, please do leave it down in the form of a comment down below. Thank you for watching. Hey, Detective Sum here, letting you know to like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, and maybe check out the links below. Thanks for watching.